Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the ninth edition of UCD in Conversation, a webinar series hosted by UCD Alumni Relations. My name is Ria Flom, and I coordinate our volunteering programs. Today, we are thrilled to welcome you, our friends from around the world, to this series to listen as UCD academics, alumni, and community partners share their stories, insights, and ideas. This series reflects our UCD's new strategy called uh, Rising to the Future, and it's four strategic themes which focus on UCD's contribution to global challenges. These are creating a sustainable global society, transforming through digital technology, building a healthy world, and empowering humanity. As many of you will know, UCD is at the forefront of fighting COVID-19, and we're committed to supporting our students through this difficult time. To date, generous alumni and friends of UCD like you have helped to raise over 200,000 euro to provide the most urgent financial and um, mental health supports to our students who need it most. So thank you to those of you who have given already to this important cause. If you'd like to support our efforts, you can visit the link which is being posted in the chat box in your own time. The format for this evening's event will be a 30 minute conversation followed by a Q&A and we'll wrap up at about 8 p.m. Please feel free to submit questions throughout the conversation using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We'll get to as many as we can, but please note that time is limited, so we mightn't be able to get to every question. If for whatever reason you need to leave the conversation early or have a problem with connectivity, don't worry. We'll be streaming live on Facebook and we'll be recording this session, so it will be available afterwards on the UCD Alumni uh, YouTube channel. Now I'd like to hand over to Holly, Holly Dignam and Teresa O'Leary, who lead our UCD in the community. This is an amazing service that's available on our campus and they'll tell you a little bit about that and set the scene for this evening's conversation. Thank you, Ria. Hello, everyone. My name is Teresa and as Ria said, my colleague Holly and I work as part of the UCD in the Community Initiative. This initiative is part of the university's commitment to building community engagement at local, national and international levels. Examples of this engagement can be seen in last year's community engagement report, which can be viewed on our website, UCD in the Community, and we will pop a link to the report in the chat, uh, in the chat now. We are so delighted that you have joined us here this evening to explore the topic, the transformative power of community engaged learning. This evening's conversation is between Mr. Gary Broderick, Dr. Hilda Lochran, and Dr. Deirdre McGillicuddy. Gary is the director of SAIL, a community project focused on improving the lives of women affected by addiction and poverty. SAIL has worked over the last 25 years to promote the needs of female drug users and their children. Hilda is an associate professor in UCD School of Social Policy, Social Work and Social Justice. And she has a special interest in issues related to drug and alcohol policy, treatment and research. Since 1997, Hilda has worked with community-based organizations and groups, focusing on transforming social work education in relation to substance use issues. And now Holly will introduce Deirdre, our host for the evening. Thank you, Teresa. Deirdre is an assistant professor in the UCD School of Education. Her work explores the intersection of pedagogy, curriculum and the psychosocial. She is particularly passionate about social inequalities and children's rights, especially in education. Deirdre was involved in the development of UCD's recently established Community Engaged Learning and Teaching or CELT network. Community Engaged Learning and Teaching affords the university an opportunity to build and strengthen strong partnerships with social and community organisations in a way that is meaningful and transformative. Gary, Hilda and Deirdre have very graciously joined us today to demonstrate how community engaged learning works for them and also the importance of collaboration with service users as partners in forming education, policy and research. So now without further ado, over to you Deirdre. Good evening. Thank you so much, Holly. Um, a warm welcome to you all to Falshiro of Galer um, to this a conversation exploring the transformative power of community engaged learning. To start today's session, I thought I might draw on the work of Brazilian educator and philosopher Paulo Freire, and he promoted a critical pedagogical approach to education 
He's best known for his influential work, uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which I would highly recommend to anybody. Um, and he states that there is no such thing as neutral education. Education either functions as an instrument to bring about conformity or freedom. He also argues that education is the practice of freedom, the means by which individuals deal critically and creatively with reality and discover how to participate in the transformation of their world. I think tonight's conversation with um, both Hilda and Gary unpack that, unpacks that a little bit more, exploring the transformative power of community engaged learning, not only in terms of individual change, but also in terms of empowering humanity, which of course is one of the strands of UCD's strategy, Rising to the Future. So without further ado, I'm going to um, introduce you to both Hilda and Gary. Thank you both so much for being here this evening. We're delighted to have you. Hilda, um, would you mind telling us a little bit about the work that you're doing in community engaged learning? Um, well, as somebody mentioned in the introduction there, um, I've been doing this since 1997. And I suppose I was very influenced by Freire and his view of education, because for me, one of the things when I came in from, I worked in the community as a social worker for many, many years, and particularly in the area of addiction. And I really recognised uh, that issue around education because in some ways education became more of a div division rather than a unity. So um, people who were educated versus people who didn't have the access to that education. And for me, um, that's not really how it works. For me, everybody has knowledge and uh, you know the fact that their knowledge is not uh, noticed or valued is the issue that we really need to address. So that's partly, I suppose, been my mission is that the knowledge and information that people in communities have is so critical. So back in that in in those in in that ninety seven, um, a group called Community Response who were working in the Liberties invited me to come and work with them because they were exploring how their communities were dealing with the crisis of drugs in their in their area, and uh, they were just the most amazing educators. I learned so much about visual arts and other alternative ways of of working around education. And uh, then Merchants Key got on board because uh, they are in that same area. And suddenly we had a real buzz going on. And UCD structures really weren't able to cope with what we wanted to do because it was very, um, it was a sort of not a formal kind of education process. Um, and so uh, with the help of Kevin Hurley at the time, he knew how to deal with UCD structures and he kind of guided us through around the box, if you like. Um, and I suppose later on, when it became established enough, we were able to hire um, a director. And we were so lucky we got Dr. Mary Ellen McCann, who had been the director of Ballyman Youth Ashkin Project. She just brought the whole project to a whole different level. We ended up with certs and diplomas in community drugs work. And she even managed the same structures so that we, we ended up with a progression route. So people who came from communities who had left education very early so now had a route directly into um, social science degree and we've had several of them over the years who've actually gone through and done social work so that's been really fantastic I suppose and um, then we got involved in trying to work with those communities around teaching them how to do research and to, research, to speak out for themselves so that was another project that we got involved in Mary Ellen and myself and um, the diploma project is still going strong uh, Laura O'Reilly from Ballymun Youth Action Project and Sarah Morton from, youth, from my school are still very involved in that and I've kind of moved on to a slightly different emphasis, which is really trying to work with professional social work education. And um, social work ha has kind of, in, in a sense, got quite a negative reputation, and in particular in the area of working with uh, women around drug use. So uh, Gary and myself got together to try and figure out if there was something we could do about that. Um, and we've been working away on that for a number of years, and that's really what the focus of our conversation tonight is going to be. Um, we're currently working on a new project in which Kulmine Therapeutic Community and their women's group uh, with Anita Harris and Polly McEwen have got involved with us as well. So there's so many people involved. Um, but th the first thing I suppose I should have said was that Gary and myself are generally speaking not let out on our own. Um, usually we have the women from SAIL with us. So um, we're under a bit of pressure tonight to behave and to represent their views. So we have actually managed to slip in their voice uh, into the conversation as well, which hopefully we will enjoy when you, we get to those bits as well. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Hilda. I'm really looking forward to that. 
Gary, will you tell us a little bit about your work in sale and then maybe tell me, tell us all a little bit about how you connected with Hilda and, and a little bit about your partnership. Um, well, Sale is based here in the North Inner City. I'm actually in Sale at the moment. And um, we're, we're based on Amian Street. And it's um, a, a, an area that has been um, documented, well documented. In fact, there was a documentary on RTE at the weekend about the experiences of the, of, um, um, the drug use and, and all that happened in the 80s and 90s. Um, so we've been at the forefront of, of the um, heroin, heroin epidemic and then ongoing drug use as that has changed and, and developed over the years. And sale itself began in, in um, 1995. It was a community initiative that, um, that grew um, from a piece of research that had been done by a student who came back with her master's. She was working in the area and um, she was suggesting that uh, women particularly needed uh, different approaches and different understandings. And that's where sale grew. But it, sale would have only happened if the community leaders of the time uh, really took, took that on and, and, um, and really created the possibility. So, and, and, and specifically went finding funding for it as well. Mm, mm. So sale has been working away. It's um, an education based program. Um, it works with women at any stage in their addiction uh, journey. Um, it's, uh, you know, we have a dream of people becoming drug free, but that's not really the main focus. Uh, really, it's for people to be in their own uh, recovery, achieving their goals. And that's what uh, we try and, and work with. But we strongly believe um, in feminism and we strongly believe in education as a way out of poverty and poverty being um, really core um, to the development of addiction issues. And uh, it was nice that you started with Paolo Freire because Paolo Freire would be one of the, uh, the people that we would lean on, um, particularly Pedagogy of the Oppressed in, in sale as, as kind of a, a guide for how we do our work here. And I suppose, uh, again, and, and COVID has thrown this into, into disarray a little bit, but everything that we try and do is about relationship, connection, um, really belonging. And uh, I think it was Johan Harry when he was writing uh, about um, addiction was saying the opposite of uh, addiction isn't recovery, it's connection. And that was a nice way of, of kind of putting um, what we try and do in sale. We have community employment, um, which has people coming in five days a week. And we have other groups that are linked with the probation service called Brio. And we have uh, aftercare groups and, and our aftercare doesn't require for you to be drug free. We, we um, really meet women at all stages. And we have a small children's project as well. And I suppose during the, the COVID outbreak, we were out uh, bringing um, connection and food and support uh, to the women in the community as well. So I suppose that's, um, that, that's the kind of work that we do. And mm -hmm. to be um, terribly um, advertising about it all, uh, you'll see more of it on saleproject.ie. <laughs> so Fantastic, really important. The, uh, there. And log on, please. It all, always helps to have more people uh, clicking on our website. Um, yeah. It was back in the day, when was it? About 2011, 2012, um, mm -hmm. I started, um, working with, with Hilda. We had worked together um, when uh, on addiction studies when you were teaching me, because I'm the young one and you're the older one. Um, oh, he's, so, he's, so, he's such a gentleman, letting that cat out of the bag, man. <laughs> well, actually, look at the pair of us. I'm the one who looks ancient here. <laughs> um, um, we we kind of had that connection, and then really we were looking at a way to, if we were going to be bringing addiction studies or a, an addiction module into um, the the classroom with the the masters in social work, how could we uh, bring the voices of the women? And and really we've had fun and. Um, you know, being creative, uh, finding ways of getting uh, the women's voices into the room. And then with the engagement with the women on that project, getting the women themselves into the classroom um, with the, the social workers themselves. Mm. Um, and how does that look like at a practical level? So if somebody was interested in, in engaging in this type of work, how do you make it work? 
I suppose I, 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 my Wi-Fi, I'm afraid, seems to be dropping a little bit. So hopefully it'll keep going. And um, I suppose one of the things for us was right from the very beginning. Traditionally, when you're talking to people about education, about drugs and alcohol, they would get somebody to come in and just spill the beans, tell their terrible story. And, you know, very much kind of almost I felt a little bit voyeuristic or something. Would you agree with that, Gary? That So we were really determined not to have that happen. So we mm. came up with this idea that we would... Uh, ask the women to work with us as collaborators uh, in developing a curriculum where they would actually set assignment for the students and give the students feedback on how well they had met the criteria for the assignment. And the women just loved it. Um, and they, I mean, we just learned so much from their approach to that. And I think that was really key to it was that they were coming in as people with knowledge and information and expertise that we wanted them to share with the students. And it wasn't about just coming in and telling some scary story that the students would sort of look back and say oh well that was a terrible thing that happened to you so i think that was uh, that piece of just the collegiality and working with them was core really to what we started out with mm. and it, hopefully we've we've maintained that um and the women uh, are colleagues which is why i was joking about the fact they're not with us tonight because generally speaking they are with us somebody comes with us yes. um, yeah. You were saying, Gary, the importance of the relationships. Uh, is that really important for you in terms of how you make this collaboration work? Well, I was kind of thinking about any of the sessions that we have and, and often with the group that we were working with, like the session time would start at, at 10 o'clock um, and, and would finish at one o'clock. And we might get down to doing the bit of work that, that Hilda was focusing on that particular one around 11.30, if we were lucky because it was really, really important that we connected, that we spoke, that we shared, that we talked, that there was um, that kind of um, coming into land together. And then that we would eat together as well. So there was that real sense of um, us being a community um, together. Um, and I think one of the reasons I think it has worked really well um, is Hilda has that natural ability uh, to connect with with the group of women who, in sale because of her experience and um, she's actually a nice person as well um, but um, when she came in she just knew you just knew Hilda that that was the way to kind of connect with the women and I don't think you can start asking um, people to share their uh, particularly people who've had uh, maybe a, a more negative experience of education uh, who had no real idea. When we started, people didn't have any real idea of what UCD even looked like. Mm. And uh, so that, the necessity of that relationship building, that of just connecting, of feeling that this was um, somebody that could be shared with, spoken with, and who was willing to listen. And we would do that in every session. That was every session. That wasn't just that we did it once and then we get down to the work every, every time it happened. Um, and it was that building that um, that that connection that that made this work because this would be no use if it wasn't beneficial to the women themselves. Um, it's great that uh, the students benefit, but if the women are not benefiting, then this has to be stopped. But what was very clear was this was hugely beneficial to the women. Gary, will you tell us a little bit about, um, I'm just going to go back to your point about the women coming to UCD. Will you tell us a little bit about that and the impact yeah. on that, of that on the women and their experience of that? Well, initially we hadn't thought about the women coming to UCD and part of um, the, the creative approach to it was um, in, in the assignment that the students in UCD had to do, they had to respond to a letter that the women had created. And the women then were going to take a look at this letter and, and give some feedback about it. What would it be like to, to receive a letter like this and give some feedback? Not marked, not anything, it was just feedback to, um, to the students. And in the process of doing that, and Hilda was there, I was there in the room, and in the process of doing it, um, there, there were funny um, pieces to it with the kind of the feedback that they were giving. Uh, but one of the things that came across very clearly was, who are these people? We don't want to be marking their piece if we don't get to meet them. Mm -hmm. and, and the women themselves asked, could, could it be arranged that they would go and meet these strange people called students? <laughs> and, and 
Um, and, and that hadn't dawned on us, uh, but it became so obvious once they had said it. So initially, uh, I think only two of the women yeah. showed up on the day. Sure. Yeah. And I think then uh, the next year after that, uh, those two brave souls went, um, there was, um, I had to uh, get a bus uh, to go out. But it really was um, that we're talking about women who may or may not have made it to leaving cert, um, may have difficulty with reading and writing, may have lots of um, negative experiences of education, and they have never been invited into um, a university setting. Um, and for them to be able to go to actually the first person they're meeting there was Hilda, so they knew somebody, um, that they were looking at these massive buildings, but um, most importantly that tea and coffee and uh, cakes were there waiting as well, so they were treated very well. Um, and then that they could go into the room and, and be there together and in a very safe way. Um, talk and share with the with the students and and lots of different stories came across and and um, I think one year when when uh, Ray who's one of the staff here went went there he kind of said what are you most worried about when you go to 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 meet a woman in in addiction and this uh, one brave student said um, well they we might get shouted at mm. and it was those kind of moments that put a humanity on everybody in the room. There was a real sense of actually this is just um, us together and, and, and hearing those stories and our women, um, they would call them the baby social workers, the students were the baby <laughs> social workers and, and that piece then of um, you know feeling that they were bringing um, the stories of other women who weren't going to be invited into the classroom and um, they felt really empowered to be ambassadors uh, for those other women because they knew these social workers would be meeting other women um, in, in their careers and they would speak for them now. And, and there was a real sense of, of um, authority and power in that, that their voice was being listened to. I was just going to add to that, uh, just that memory of our first time when they, I had particularly not been fussed about whether the women came into the classroom or not because of this you know, concern that I had about how that would go down. Um, and then they asked if they could do it, and I said, absolutely, that'd be brilliant. But I always remember so the, the fact we didn't know how many would come, and the two came, and um, I was so touched because their generosity was just incredible. Um, they were so terrified and so nervous, and I had met them maybe three, four times maybe, but we had done, as Gary says, you know, got to know one another and chatted away and, you know, uh, built up a relationship. And one of them just said to me, um, I said to her, oh, you're amazing to come. And especially since there was only two of you. And she said, I wouldn't let you down. And I thought to myself, that was just, I, I, I almost cried because I just thought, my goodness, this, la this lady is so committed to this and to, to the relationship was so important to her that she was prepared to take this everything on and now as Gary says busloads of them come because they just love coming and the students get so much from it and I, I think one of the things um, and Gary and myself I joke Gary about this all the time because um, it started off with UCD and now himself and the women do gigs all over the place so um, he ha he has no loyalty to us in UCD sometimes so I have to w shake my head at him for that because okay. um, they are like star performers now they, 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 the women are so confident uh, they know what they want the message they want to give they're really able to articulate so well uh, what their experience is like and what they need from services and in particular what they need from social workers. So they've actually gone to other universities, they've gone to other professional groups, they've even uh, presented internationally and at conferences and various places like that to, to speak out for themselves and to represent their own views but also as Gary says other women um, in the project and other women that they know who don't get as far as coming into the project. Mm. Hilda, um, can I ask what um, the benefit has been for the students that you work with? How have they benefited from community engaged learning? Um, well, uh, the students themselves would say that it, the impact of it is just so much greater because um, the reality, I suppose, for many, many students is that they, they, they can't really understand what life is like for people who get into uh, 
drugs for a start off um, and certainly not people who are in the situation that the women in sale are in or the women in cool mind for that matter are in where you know there's poverty issues and disadvantage as well uh, as well as just the drugs so i think for the students one of the big things has been uh, an ability to uh, learn from the women about what that experience is like and trying to empathize with that, which is a key skill in social work. So I think that's been very important. But more important, I think, than that has been that when they meet up, uh, they, they realize these are women, these are people who have struggles, but they're people who are smart and funny and, you know, normal people. Um, and, you know, when I started doing this at the very beginning, I had students who would say to me, I've never met somebody with a drug problem. I am, I'm so, as Gary said, frightened of this. What's it going to be like? Um, what can I say to them? Uh, you know, will I be able to have a conversation with them? Uh, how, how is it going to figure out? And so that whole, the mystique of the drugs use issue, and also, I think, highlighting the amazing strength and resilience of the women who survived that experience and, you know, hopefully come out from that experience. I think that has really reassured social workers that these are people that we can work with and that, um, the work is going to be fruitful and promising. Uh, when I got into the drugs end of uh, social work, people have said to me, why are you getting into that? It never gets anywhere. And that's wrong. It, it couldn't be more wrong. Uh, these, these women, and it happens to be a women's group we're working with at the moment, but um, obviously I've worked a lot with uh, males in, in the drug scene as well. And the same is true there, uh, you know, so Which resilient. Would you say then, Gary and Hilda, you know, that this type of work is really impacting on individuals' lives? Yeah. Is that fair to say? You want to tell the story, Gary, about the social worker and the sale woman? Well, that, that was a nice one. And this, um, I, I was chatting with a group of the women yesterday and one of them had had a bad experience with a social worker. She had agreed to do a piece of work and then um, jumped the gun. Uh, and, and didn't do what she had promised. And, and, and the woman was very upset and, and given out about social workers and the like. And one of the other women said, well, I have a brilliant social worker and um, she did the course and our work must be working because she's the best social worker I've ever had. <laughs> and, and she was basically saying that that respect and, and mutuality that came from, because they recognized each other from this process. And, and it was just really lovely because there was a balanced conversation about social workers. It, it wasn't a, a lazy one-sided, oh, they're all bad. It was really saying, gosh, um, you had a bad experience. Now, what can you do there? Um, and that was really, really powerful. But I think one of the things as well that's important in all this is that um, addiction is not a straightforward, straight line, uh, easily explained phenomenon. It's a complex um, thing. Um, that uh, involves um, really uh, uh, us to challenge the way that we think about things. And very often the narrative is that, you know, we have greedy individuals who don't know how to control themselves and blah, 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 blah which, is not, which is a nonsense. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, when we get the students and the, the women together in this process, there's a, a real chance for um the the elements of the understanding of the role that poverty plays in it that trauma plays in it that ongoing traumas play in it um that really for a lot of the women that we're working with drugs happen to be available and they became the useful way of managing what was an, an almost impossible situation at times and that um that piece is so important for us to 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 grasp and understand because um, as social workers, as people working with uh, women or men in addiction, um, we can set up ridiculous uh, care plans, impossible goals, um, and because we don't really stop to think actually what's possible here and what supports need to be put in place. Um, one of the um, reminders or, or new learnings almost in COVID was just how um, poor people can be so quickly, not just in food poverty, but in um, the, the lack of supports in the community, the lack of access to other people, um, and so that isolation and loneliness. And again, if we don't listen to that, then mm -hmm. we set up silly goals, silly care plans that collapse. And if we then turn around and blame the service user, 
uh, mm -hmm. for not doing what we told them to do, then we all end up uh, banging our heads against the wall. And I think in this whole process, um, we've we not only help the, um, the the students get a better sense about that, we actually get give the women a chance to reflect on that themselves, because as they're explaining their story to others, they're getting a better grasp of how their life story is impacting on their um, the their need for drugs at times um, and why drugs were a reasonable answer, which tells you how ridiculous the question was. Um, but uh, that they're getting a chance to really um, stop and say, well, instead of being swamped by the shame and the guilt of being somebody who chose to use drugs, um, they're getting to see, well, actually at that time, those drugs eased or, or helped me cope or just gave me a sense of purpose uh, where there wasn't one. Um, and, and that has been a really powerful piece. Mm. Um, I think the, the other piece I just want to say at this point is that um, sale being involved is really important. Um, not just because myself and Hilda get on and work well together, but also the women need support to do this work. You can't just bring a group of service users out to a university to engage uh, and then expect that that won't have uh, an impact on people, that the vulnerability of doing that, the, the helping people process that. So, um, you know, for anybody who's watching in or thinking, well, let's just go and, and drop by another project and, and see if we can get them involved. Yes, do explore that, but ensure that the people who are doing it get it as well, that the, the people who are involved in it, the women, the service users, um, get the right supports so that they're processing what's going on and that it's not harmful. Great advice. I say, sorry, dear, to just yeah, to reiterate that, that because sure. uh, we're working on a project at the moment, which is we're actually um, asking women uh, in different projects to to help us design a guide for social work practice, which is sort of a, a new approach we're having. But key to what it, it's all about is that, like, I tend to just work with services that I, that I know that they are there to support the women as well because like I come in and you know we have some incredibly uh, difficult conversations around the complexity of the lives they've had themselves you know many of the women have you know been in care themselves and have had very good experiences of that and it can raise a lot of concerns and sometimes I go in to a meeting with the women and something has happened or something arises and we we don't even get to what we intended to that day because just there are other priorities. So that ability to uh, work at their pace is, is critically important. And to be very respectful of the processes that they have, I think is really, really an important element of it. And ultimately it, it might take a little bit longer sometimes to get to where you want to get to, but then sometimes you get to somewhere that you haven't even thought about. So that's even better again. Yeah, fantastic. Um, I think we might just pause there for a moment. Gary, I'm going to invite you to um, introduce the object poverty piece, um, which I think illustrates a lot of what you are both speaking about this evening. So I'll hand over to you, Gary, to introduce it. Well, we're, we're lucky in sale to have Ray and, and, and the women who are very creative. And one piece that we did um, a few years ago was create a piece of art called Object Poverty. And it began by asking about 230 people, um, what three objects uh, could they name that represented poverty for them? And then we got all the, together and then we got our top 16, because 16 seemed like the right number. And, uh, and then Ray went off and photographed them. And we, um, we used this piece then uh, in promoting poverty, not only within our own organization to help the women kind of understand uh, that poverty is real and normal and nothing to be ashamed of, but also to highlight um, its, um, it, its role uh, in people's lives for professionals. And we, because I think because of the confidence we had in working with Hilda and UCD, uh, we were engaged a lot with other universities. I, I won't name any of them for... Uh, <laughs> no names allowed. <laughs> uh, it's a touchy point. It's a touchy point. <laughs> it's a touchy point. But to, to, to Breach, particularly thanks for, for the support that she gave us. And we brought that and we had this really wonderful conversation, particularly where students had their own experiences of poverty and that being shared. And some of the images um, that we had of the 16 images that we had a particular sense of what they were about. When we started this conversation, and we began to have different images. And the one that we're going to show here, I think is the coffee cup. 
And that for us initially was um, about, um, about uh, um, begging, but it became about the price of breakfast. Brilliant. Thank you, Gary. We might play it here now. I am a paper cup. I could have come from one of the many coffee shops that have spread across our cities and towns. Here you can get free Wi-Fi, warmth, gentle music, wooden bookshelves with wooden decorations, histories of coffee making, illustrated walls, as many serviettes as you need to take and reasonably clean toilets. You can also get hot chocolate, hot chocolate with cream and marshmallows, chai latte, speciality latte, cappuccino, double shot espressos, Makita in any size with any flavoured syrup and all for just €3.65. €3.65 is what might cost you to feed yourself for a day if you are smart and of course if you have some means of cooking. Even for just toast and a pan for the beans will do. Then €3.65 will get you a loaf of bread for $0.75, cents, tea bags $0.89, cents, a tin of beans $0.49, cents, a litre of milk $0.75, cents, a bar of chocolate $0.65, cents, beans on toast, tea and chocolate, what more could you need? The remaining balance of $0.08 cents can go towards the cost of the electricity used to boil the kettle, heat the beans and make the toast. It's tempting to spend it all on paper cup of coffee and sit on the sofas and listen to the music and be warm and feel like everybody else. But that doesn't always work for you because being poor, you don't feel like everybody else and you certainly would feel too embarrassed to ask for the codes to use the toilet and the person behind the counter does not smile at you. The paper cup can also be used for begging should the knees arise. I am a paper cup. Wow. Yeah. So powerful. Um, the, the women presented that at the Irish uh, Social Work Conference, the IASW conference. And uh, I mean, they, they got a standing ovation for a startup, but um, the women asked people in the audience to identify what they would have their understanding of poverty. And it just, it was such an, a moving experience. And you're, you're talking about, you know, transformative education. I think that was one of the most transformative things I've ever seen. It was quite incredible, um, the audience response to it. And really just recognising that something that we take so much for granted, like a cup of coffee, that people don't even, well, maybe now they're thinking more about it than, than before, uh, just had such a whole different meaning. And every single one of the images there's a story behind it. So, um, and again, if you go to the sale website, you'll see that. But yeah. uh, incredible. Gary, um, I mean, that is incredible. It's a, it's a real um, snapshot into people's lived reality. Um, you touched a little bit on it, and I suppose we can't let the conversation go without asking, how has COVID-19 impacted on the community and also, I suppose, on your work together in community-engaged learning? Well, I think a lot of, um, you know, the initial response was responding to, to the needs of the women. Um, we didn't close our doors throughout um, COVID. Um, we were here. Um, very, very early on, people were knocking on the front door looking for basics. Uh, they weren't looking for pasta and toilet roll, they were looking for milk and bread. Um, so the, the, the reality of poverty kicked in very quickly. Um, something like, uh, you know, the very clever idea of um, paying people every two weeks, which sounds really good on the surface, caused mayhem in people's homes. They, you know, they couldn't manage the money and they didn't have access to um, or they maybe had domestic violence going on and that money was disappearing. Um, and so very, very quickly, um, we got great support from um, our fellow, you know, our colleagues in the area. Um, and shout out to Chrysalis and to Crinan and uh, the Snog and all, all of the great projects in, in the area and to um, City Clinic across the road. Great work being done there. But um, Mel and, and everybody on the task force were really kind phone calls coming in, giving us support. Um, 
and uh, I'm sure I'm forgetting somebody, but um, you know, we were we were trying to work out well what could we do, and so we we were in contact with our CH09 overlords and uh, Donal and and Brian and Declan were really supportive and gave us rather than being redeployed, they allowed us to go and. Uh, continue doing reach outs uh, to people. So we just felt that we needed to have eyes on. We couldn't have hands on, so we had eyes on. So we went out uh, to uh, people's homes, uh, bringing food packages, bringing education packs, activities for the children, but really uh, keeping an eye on mental health, on uh, child protection issues, and unfortunately domestic violence and addiction. Um, and people were maybe initially it was okay, but were really slip sliding. Um, I mean, it was really, for me, it was really interesting just watching how initially it felt like, well, welcome to our world uh, where we were all living the life with this new virus because a lot of people in addiction have been living with viruses for a very long time. And they were going, what is the, what is the fuss we've been managing this for years? Um, and then as time went on, really the, uh, the, the erosion of confidence, the, the impact on, uh, I mean, really trauma um, experiences from the past, being confined, being everything being um, almost blocked in. And, and uh, so we, we noticed mental health, we noticed domestic violence. We were going out trying to make relationships with both the women and the men in order to try and ease that, making sure that the children were safe. So there was an awful lot of that. And I have to admit, I wasn't particularly focused on uh, the, the learning objectives. Um, but, it, but I have to say, I mean, we have students on placement with us and a lot of the placements were stopped. And I really felt um, sad at times that um, the students couldn't have been part of that experience because it would have been transform transformative um, just going out. And I think for me, what, what more than anything, um, the, the violence, um, that, that some of our women have to live with and live in both in the community and in their own behind their own front doors um, but also just um, the, the lack of support the lack of um, connection um, and that immediate poverty I mean the, the very simple thing of trying to maintain contact where people don't have wi-fi um, mm -hmm. so it wasn't possible to do Zooms with them. It wasn't possible to, um, maybe they didn't have phones. I mean, there was a great initiative that Anna Liffey and, and Chrysalis were doing in bringing people. And one of the things they were doing was bringing people phones and mm -hmm. um, just to be able to maintain that contact. And I think sometimes, again, it's so easy for us as professionals um, to forget that those um, basics um, just don't exist um, for everybody that we work with. And the number of times that we were um, trying to access um, electricity, trying to access um, Wi-Fi or paying for phones or whatever, just those kind of basics. And hats off to the HSC for being as, as supportive as they, as they were. Thank you for sharing that, Gary. Hilda, um, I might come to you to ask you about the challenges of doing community engaged learning. Um, are there challenges to this type of work um, and why is it so important, do you think? I think within an academic setting, there, there are a lot of challenges because in the early days, uh, as I said, the structures just weren't in place to support this kind of work. So it's great now, uh, you know, the new strategy really underpins this kind of work. So, that, so that's fantastic. And there has been an awful lot more flexibility in terms of allowing us to do this kind of work and encouraging us and supporting us to do that. So that's that's been really, really important. Uh, but yeah, I think that would be one of the key pieces is that the structures weren't there to support it. The other piece is that as academic we're under a lot of pressure to publish and do research and uh, sometimes either the work in doing it this way can be a little bit slower and uh, I suppose I didn't set out to do this with a view to publications and with a view to um, doing research but um, actually the women made sure that we got published because they decided that it wasn't enough to be talking to the students and you said they, they wanted an, an international platform so they made us a uh, it, they decided on an international journal, so we, we ended up getting published in one of the prestigious social work journals because the women decided that this is what needed to happen. So, wow. um, you know, I think that, that that's been another shift that um, certainly in, in universities in general, 
there really has to be a way of formally acknowledging that this work is important because we need more and more uh, academics to get involved at this sort of a level. And um, I know there are loads of people already doing that in UCD, uh, you know, as Holly and Teresa have talked about that. Uh, so it's the kind of support and the, and the recognition for, the, for that work and also just ways of really helping communities to feel included as being a part of uh, the campus. I think even just as from the very outset, the, the geographic location of UCD makes it, you have to do extra work to really connect with communities because a lot of the communities that I work with are not within an easy reach of UCD. And as Gary said, like sort of sense that they would never even think of UCD as a place to go or be involved in. So you've got a lot of challenges like that that really have to be addressed as well. Yeah, I think um, the work of Campus Engage as well, I think has been very critical in foregrounding this work. And it's been a really good way of sort of um, looking at it from a more systemic uh, level as well. Um, I'm really- Like myself, I was just going to say it here, yeah. like myself now have a community of people that we can refer to and so yeah. we all support each other and we're all we're all very excited and really interested in, in this yeah. kind of work so so that's Brilliant. lovely to have that community with Brilliant. Um, I'm, I'm conscious of time and I was I was I swore I swore I'd keep to time <laughs> so we'd allow a little bit of space for questions I suppose I'll, I'll finish maybe with this question for you both and maybe we'll start with um, yourself Gary um, what do you hope for the future of the work you're doing with UCD around community engaged learning? What are your hopes for the future for this type of work? Um, I suppose uh, being brief, because I know you're short of time, but yeah. uh, I mean, I think um, projects like, like SAIL have unique um, insights into big questions. You know, so when we're talking about something like what's addiction, unless we go to projects like sale um, to, to listen to their answers then you know we're not really enriching um the, the the academic study enough i don't i don't believe and i think um the more we can do that the better and if we can do that in a way that enriches the lives of the people we go to in that conversation um that's good too because in as much as academics can get stuck in their own rut um, we in projects get stuck in our own ruts too, and we don't know always how to frame um, our story or our understanding of things. And I, I was thinking earlier, and um, I don't know if you remember the song that came out, it was out in about the end of the 90s. It was, um, if everybody looks the same, we'd get tired of looking at each other. And I think that that's, the, you know, there's a piece there that we can, you know, if, if Sail is over here just looking at ourselves and if UCD is over here just looking at ourselves, we'll get tired of looking at each other and, and we get very bored. And I think if we can keep that conversation going and adding in uh, new elements uh, so that everybody benefits, um, we'll have a much better vista to be looking. Fantastic. Thanks a million. Hilda, what are your hopes for the future for this type of work? In community? Well, I think I probably already said just that I think within UCD, uh, I'm so excited about the fact that we now have a community of people who are all interested in this. So I think that's very important. I mean, my goal would be uh, to just, uh, I think Gary myself spoke about it a little bit more, just um, that if there was some way in which we could um, Build the links with UCD and projects like SAIL so that the educational element of it would be a benefit not just to our students, which it definitely is, but to the to the women themselves. Like Gary has a goal that he would like to see somebody from the SAIL project end up becoming a social worker. Not quite sure if that would be their chosen profession, but um, that would be fantastic. And we've had people who've come through our other uh, diploma in drugs work that I spoke about earlier who have actually gone through and done that course. So that's one aspect of it. The other piece I think is, as Gary said, that to just, uh, like I was involved in that project where we taught people in the community to do research. And I think it's about, um, part of it is us being prepared to understand their experience. And another part of it, I think is helping them to find a voice and to be able to explain that experience in a way that can be heard by people like academics and professionals. So it's a kind of a two way process. Mm -hmm. And I suppose that's where we're heading with the Cool Mind sale project at the moment is really trying to give uh, people in these in the in the projects uh, a voice that will be listened to. Fantastic, Hilda. Um, I think you've a lovely segue there for yes. us into the into the poem. So would you yeah. like to introduce um, the poem that we're going to share? Um, so I suppose uh, 
as I said at the very, very beginning, some of the things that I've learned as an academic has been just to appreciate uh, the importance of uh, creativity and art and visual experience and also of music and of poetry. And uh, so the women in sale are, are brilliant poets. They've just got their, again, on the website, uh, you can visit their poetry library. But um, so I've just picked one poem that speaks to a lot of what we've been talking about tonight. And it's called It's a Shame. And one of the women has uh, is going to read it out to us. So It's a Shame. And it was written, I think, around 2012 or something like that. So a while ago, but it, it's very poignant for today. And Laura is going to read it to us. Brilliant, thank you. Hi, my name is Laura and I'm going to recite one of the poems that my sale sisters wrote and it's called It's a Shame. It's a shame the way the world works, families and children with poor health hurts. Why is it nobody cares? The world should just try to share. If only we'd all open our eyes then we'd see a big difference and surprise. Not only could we help the needy, but make a big start to stop being greedy. It's a shame the way the world has gone. Poverty, homeless and jobless, that's wrong. So open your hearts and eyes to see that the world we love is in poverty. Again, really powerful words by Laura there. Um, thank you so much for sharing. Um, we'll move on to um, the questions and answers. I think, uh, thank you to everybody for um, sharing your questions with us this evening. Um, so we'll have time maybe for one or two of them. Um, the first question is around, uh, was asked by Camille and she asked, are there other similar programs to this happening with other Irish universities? <laughs> and it would be great to see initiatives like this adopted at scale. Um, Gary, <laughs> you might have some info on that one. <laughs> well, uh, obviously I'm not allowed to mention any of them. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, none, none that have been as long lasting as this one because um, one, once Hilda gets her hooks into you, you can't get away. Um, not, not, not as uh, we, we've been working with um, teachers, with nurses, with other social workers. So um, we have um, smaller versions of it from sale, uh, and I'm, I'm just not sure that there are any others. Do you know any others going on, um, Hilda? Uh, well, I'd be just aware of the ones in social work, but uh, mostly uh, there are other projects, but I don't think there's anything quite like this one going on. And in fact, I would say that even my colleagues in other social work schools have actually had you come visit anyway so I found that out on the QT. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very I mean we're, we're you know I'm, I, we tease each other about this all the time but I mean it's 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 just brilliant that uh, that's the way it's going and uh, I suppose the other thing is that you know, there has been a bit of um, a push towards engaging service users in a more meaningful way and this is certainly mm. I think a really good example of how you can do it in a way that mm. is meaningful so Brilliant. Um, we have a second question here from Edwina. Good evening, Edwina. Um, Edwina asked, what advice would you give to everyone to help reduce the stigma of addiction in society and reduce the isolation? It's a, a big question. Um, I, I don't know the easy answer to that, but what I do know is that SAIL is working with Citywide at the moment um, and we're trying to put a piece together. So there's a group of sale women working on that one, Edwina. Um, so I hope to have a better answer for you in a few more weeks time um, because it, it's an absolutely essential one. And I think we were only discussing Hilda that, um, you know, um, all of the marginalized groups that are in this country, they've managed to find their voice to, you know, um, become more almost mainstream, uh, except for people who use drugs. Uh, and the stigma that is associated with it, I mean, it is, it's appalling, really. And it really impacts on that recovery journey and makes it that bit more difficult. And I think, however difficult it is in general, it is very, very hard for women who use drugs. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't forgive women easily, and we definitely don't forgive women for using drugs. Um, so it, it is a piece that, that requires a lot of work and attention. And I do think that... Uh 
people who have experience of drug use have been actually, there's a long history of people in recovery really working very, very hard to help other people to recover from drug use or to cope with it. So it, it like, I mean, that's one of the most impressive things about the field. Um, and yet it, it gets completely overlooked in many ways. Um, and there, there is an organization that speaks out for people who have drug use issues and drug use experience. But yeah, Gary is right. Like for some reason, there's just such a stigma attached to drugs. And I think more recent reports were just showing that that stigma is going to be challenged quite a bit now because there's been a big shift away from it just you know, being all about heroin, which everybody looks down their nose at and kind of thinks, oh, that's a terrible drug, to a much greater uh, um, number of people using things like, for example, cocaine. And so I think our views are going to have to shift. So, we're, you know, the drug use issue is hitting populations of people now that are in work, that are educated um, and a different sort of group of society. So sometimes I wonder about, you know, is the stigma about being poor or is it about having a drugs issue? Uh, mm. You know, and when those two things come together. Yes. Yeah, yeah, it's the intersection of both. The intersection of those two things, yeah. Look, I, I just want to say a massive thank you, Hilda and Gary, for what has been a truly engaging and inspiring conversation this evening. I mean, the work you're doing around community engaged learning is so critical. And I think you've really demonstrated here this evening the transformative power of community engaged learning, um, not only in terms of the individuals, but also in terms of empowering humanity. Um, and what really came across to me actually in our conversations tonight and, and previously was your passion, your care, your empathy um, for the work that you're doing and the importance of that. Um, and it's really, truly commendable. And I wish you both the very best of luck with your work into the future. Um, I really want to especially thank the Women of the Sale Project. Thank you so much for sharing your powerful voices in such a creative and thought-provoking way this evening. Um, you are amazing, amazing women and you have much to teach us about life. So thank you. We appreciate your generosity in sharing your experiences with us this evening. I'd like to especially mention Laura, who read the poem, It's a Shame. Um, you read it so eloquently and passionately. So thank you so much for that, Laura. Thank you um, to the audience for tuning in this evening. We really appreciate you being here and for engaging in the chat and in the questions and answers. Um, and I would personally like to thank Holly and Teresa from UCG in the community and Ria from UCG alumni for all their efforts in organising this evening and supporting the work of the Celt Network. Um, I started with a quote from Paolo Freire, so I'm going to finish with a quote from Paolo Freire. Um, he says that education does not actually change the world. Education changes people and it is the people who change the world. So for me, Gurmila Mahogov, and thank you so much for having me this evening. I'm going to hand back to Ria. Thanks so much. And I think um, Holly and Teresa, you will absolutely um, agree that it was a fantastic conversation, a real treat and a real window in. Absolutely. Do you want to say anything and, before Yeah, ju ju just thank you. A massive thank you to, to Deirdre and to Hilda and to Gary and of course to the Women of the Sale Project. You know, without this, we wouldn't be here having this conversation. Um, it's an extremely thought-provoking and powerful conversation. So thank you all so much. Um, if anyone wants more information on the Celt Network, uh, we'll pop that information in the chat and please check out the Sale Project website. Um, that will be in the chat as well. So thank you all. Brilliant. And a big thank you from each of us, um, from each of us in the UCD Alumni uh, Relations team, but um, really appreciate that you've taken the time to share your, your expertise with us. It's a real window in and it's an inspiration. Um, and a special thank you to everyone who's tuning in today, um, because without your participation, your engagement and your questions, um, this would just be a chat with us in the corner. So we really appreciate your time. Um, this series will be back again in two weeks time on Thursday, the 30th of July with an insightful conversation on mental health, um, which is certainly a topic that weaves into this time that we've had tonight together, um, um, but beyond as well. Details haven't yet been announced, but I hear they're in the works. Um, but if you'd like to keep up with the um, information in the next series, or the next event in the series, or any of the watchback links um, of any of the other sessions that have come uh, before this, this will be our ninth session today. So. Um, you can check any of that out now um, in the direct link which will be shared in the chat box, the UCD In Conversation virtual series. 
Uh, we'd also be interested in any topics that you think, um, any suggestions you think would be uh, of interest to, to hear from us. Um, there's so much incredible research that happens at UCD. So simply email any of your ideas to alumni at ucd.ie. That concludes our evening. Thank you all so much for being here and we look forward to welcoming you to our next session. Please stay safe and stay well. Good night.